I'm sitting here with Jim Chambers, a friend of a long, long time, and we're going to talk about uh, uh, the work that he's been doing. Um, Jim, how did you get started in this business? Actually, I got started when I was 13. Um, I heard of a, an old-time shooting match that was held at the uh, Cataloochee Ranch in Maggie Valley, North Carolina. And uh, I begged my mother to take me to the match. And she reluctantly agreed, and um, while there, we ran into one of her cousins who said, would that boy like to shoot? And um, Mom said, well, yeah, you might let him shoot one time. So he loaded up the gun, and um, I shot, and he loaded again, and I shot again, and I ended up, he just abandoned his shooting, and I shot the rest of the day. One third place in the middle. Great. So um, <clears throat> the... Um, the, this was a yearly event, you know, they had that match every year, so the next summer I um, um, mowed lawns all summer, saved up enough money to buy an old gun, it was an old plain stock gun, and um, the bore was very bad, but I shot it anyway in the next match, the next summer when I was 14. Didn't do too good, I, I won third place again. So I decided the only way to move up was to make a new gun. So the next summer, worked all summer long again, uh, saved enough money to buy parts for a new gun. And um, that's when I ran into Earl Lanning. Okay. And um, Earl had some good parts. Um, I, I planned on buying stuff from Dixie Gunworks. Earl said, don't buy that stuff. He said, I'll mm -hmm. show you some good parts. <laughs> Sold me a Bill Large Barrel and a good okay. piece of curly maple wood. And back then, we were using original locks. I mean, sure. that was before Siler. Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, first three or four guns I built had original locks on them. But I uh, got connected with Earl, and uh, when I was 15, I made that first gun, and uh, been at it ever since. Uh, I, I remember seeing a picture of you in a Foxfire book, uh -huh. uh, working on a gun, uh, and I know you worked for uh, at Prentice to Britain, uh, John Bivens. Was, was that farther along? Or? Yeah, that was, uh, that was in 1970 and 71, I worked at, uh, at Old Salem, uh, not as an apprentice, so. To Bivens. Okay. Um, the arrangement was Bivens was curator of crafts. Okay. And he hired me to be the uh, master of the gun shop. Okay. Uh, You're the, the journeyman uh, that's there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd already been making guns for quite a while then. Oh, okay. Um, uh, actually, uh, I was home from um, from school and talking with Earl, and Earl asked what I was going to do the following summer uh, between. Uh, you know, years of college. And told him I didn't know, and as well, I, I think there's might be an opening for a, a gun maker at Old Salem. So he called John Bivens uh, right on the spot, and John said, "Well, send the guy down and let me interview him." So I drove down to uh, Old Salem and got out of the car, knocked on John's door, and he came to the door, and I just handed him the rifle. Uh huh. Looked it over a couple of minutes, and he said, "You're hired." <laughs> <laughs> Your work speaks for itself. <laughs> so that was that was pretty much the interview. Oh, that's cool. Uh, that's all he needed to know, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. So I worked uh, in, in '70 and '71 there in the gun shop. Okay. Uh, and uh, of course, hung out with John a lot. Uh, sure. Wasn't really apprenticed to him. Yeah, but, uh, I, that's, that's the wrong word. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, they kind of got that wrong in the Foxfire book. I see. Um, I think they said in there that I was apprenticed. Maybe that's maybe yeah, that's where I that's, that's got that impression. Yeah. Um, now you were you did the Foxfire thing prior to working with John? No, that was much was after that. Oh, uh, it was. The Foxfire book was written in seventy. Five or seventy-six, somewhere along in there. Okay. And um, they needed uh, photos of me to put in the book, and I had photos from when I was working at Old Salem. I get you. Uh, but that was five years okay. before the book okay. came out. So you're getting me straightened out on a lot of stuff here, Jim. Uh, talking to, talking about your guns. Uh, what what kind of gun do you is your favorite to build? As Earl Lanning says, those big old early wide-butted guns. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I like the early stuff. Um, uh, particularly fond of the early Pennsylvania guns. You know, anything from the 
1760s up through the 1780s. Okay. Uh, later stuff, I'm not real crazy about. I've built a few of those, but. Uh, okay, pre federal period, I yeah, guess it'd be a way. for the earlier guns. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Germanic versus English? Either one. Yeah. Okay. Either one. Um, Started out just uh, you know, the type of guns those uh, German gun makers were making there in Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. uh, Lancaster, York, uh, and, and those areas, Lebanon County. Uh, made several J.P. Beck guns over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, in recent years, I've uh, gotten more into doing the Little English Fowlers. Uh, um, as my engraving skills have been improved over the years, uh, um, sometimes you can get beyond what the um, American gun makers were doing in the yeah. period and uh, uh, to get into some of the stuff the English were doing. Sure. It's pretty well wide open. From that yeah, point. yeah. Where, where does the, the, the Siler lock business fit into all this? Well, Bud Siler was a neighbor. He only okay. lived uh, two or three miles down the road from him for many years. And, um, uh, of course, I've always used Siler Locks, uh, known Bud since before he ever started the business. I've okay. been friends for a long time. And uh, we always had sort of a gentleman's agreement or understanding that um, when he got ready to retire and let the business go, that, um, that I would take it over. Okay. Uh, Bud, was, Bud and his wife Dottie were very... Um, they didn't. They didn't have any children, and that business was kind of their child. Okay. They, they really looked at it that way, uh -huh. and um, they could have sold that business to any one of a number of people. Um, uh -huh. It was a very good business, but um, and they could have sold it for them probably twice what I paid for it. Uh -huh. um, I paid all that I could afford to pay. Uh -huh. But um, they preferred that their business go to me for a lesser price than to go to someone else because okay. they felt that I would carry on the same tradition, the same quality well, that, that they had built into it. Sure. So we'd always sort of had that agreement. Um, and uh, one Friday afternoon I stopped by there to pick up uh, some lock parts and Bud says, well, I visited my accountant today and said he told me that uh, the business has got to go. Uh, he turned 65 and okay. had to start drawing on his um, IRAs and mm -hmm. retirement uh, package that he had set up. And so he said, the uh, account told me it's going to cost me a whole bunch of money to keep that business. Okay. So he said, it's time. time to go. Uh, it scared me to death. I had a, <laughs> I had a good federal job, you know. Uh -huh. Benefits, uh, sure. retirement, everything. This means uh, changing to full time. Oh yeah, this stuff, doesn't absolutely. It? So um, the, the first question I asked, but I said, "Let me see your tax return from the last three years." Uh -huh. And uh, looking at those, it didn't take long to realize, you know, this is a, a viable business. Okay. Um, <laughs> but wasn't making a, uh, much more money than I was making you know, as a federal employee. But, uh -huh. So the income was about the same. I thought, well, what the heck, I don't have to put up with all those uh, federal bureaucrats. And plus, there are some advantages. Plus drive about 20 miles each way to yeah. work uh, every day. And then this business is at your home now or close right. by? Well, it's, uh, it's kind of spread out in the area. Uh, well, actually spread out all over the country to a certain oh. extent. Uh, we do have the... Uh, uh, business there in the uh, basement area of, of our house. It's, we turned that into one big large shop. Okay. Um, but uh, right there is mainly just uh, me, my wife, uh, and my daughter. Mm -hmm. We have uh, one guy that comes in and helps us with packing and shipping from time to time when we need it. But uh, we employ contract labor people. Okay. Um, we actually employ about 12 people all together. And uh, they come over, pick up parts, take it back to their own little shops, do all the machining and everything. Okay. And then they bring the locks back over and we send mm -hmm. them out from there. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was thinking when, when Bud was doing this, there were probably large and small silers, plunk and percussion. Mm -hmm. You have other locks available now. Right, uh, yeah, I had you've already, added to them. I'd already developed several additional locks before I bought the silers. I see. So I was already into the lock business. Okay. 
and uh, familiar with it. And, uh, of course, Bud knew that and seen the work that I was doing. And, and, uh, he knew it was in good hands. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. Uh, another thought I had is that uh, since, since, uh, since I've known you, the, the, uh, uh, like a chamber's kit has come into the, to the picture. Uh, I, I imagine that's a, a, you know, connects, you know, stock makers and barrel makers and everything else. So, uh, want to speak to that a minute? Sure. Um, the, the rifle kit thing kind of got started with John Bivens and the uh, uh, bicentennial rifles that were being made back in 1776. The uh, York Historical Society decided to, uh, uh, for the centennial, uh, to offer rifles to various members mm -hmm. of their society, and uh, they asked uh, John Bivens to make 100 of those, uh, Jack Hall made another 100, um, um, uh, I think there were a couple of other people involved in that big project, but in order to do that volume of work, they had to go to uh, a machine stock. Sure. Mm -hmm. So um, Joe Scarzoni, who lived uh, in the neighborhood, bought one of the uh, machines and machined out a lot of those stocks. So when I saw that being done, I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm basically making the same style of rifle over and over. Mm -hmm. So I talked with Joe and um, got the information about making patterns to put in the machine. So, um, I had um, two or three different patterns already set up just to sure. machine the guns that I was making, mm -hmm. you know, as a custom maker. It's a natural, and, natural uh, step ahead, isn't it? And uh, then um, Don Getz uh, and Bob Lepley, who also owned one of the machines, approached me one day and said, you know, we really like the guns that you're making and you've got really sophisticated patterns, you know, sure. really great stuff. Um, why don't we go into the rifle kit business? Okay. Don said, I'll supply the barrels. Uh, Bob Lepley said, I'll machine all the stocks, uh, get all the wood, inventory, everything. And uh -huh. uh, you can make the locks and you know, the other sure. hardware. Yeah. Uh, so in, in 87, we sort of formed a, a, a kind of loose partnership sure. deal and um, started selling rifle kits. Okay. And, um, uh, it's evolved over the years uh, uh, when Don Getz retired and um, uh, we weren't able to get the number of barrels that we needed from, uh, from the Sun John. Uh -huh. uh, and at the same time, I kind of turned that whole rifle kit business over to my daughter to manage. Okay. So uh, she gets the barrels uh, wherever, and uh, mm -hmm. Bob Lepley still machines the stocks for us. Okay. We haven't changed anything there. But, uh, I, I learned just this trip down to Friendship that Elsie uh, uh, Rice is one of your rock assemblers. Yes, Elsie uh, uh, and his uh, brother started the, the barrel business, but uh, that's really not a full-time job for him. And basically, he can go in in the morning, set the machines up. He has a son that works there with him, and um, she, uh, the son just kind of watches the machines, sure. which frees up LC to do other things. So sure. he uh, assembles rocks for us the rest of the day. Okay, I enjoyed talking to him last week this time. Um, is there anything that, that uh, we haven't talked about that, that you're passionate about? Uh, anything about a, a favorite lock, favorite gun, anything like that that I ought to include? Uh, not, uh, not really. Uh, being sort of in the business and trying to run a business has consumed the, uh, uh, the vast majority of my time over the last 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. So production of uh, custom guns has dropped off to uh, uh, maybe one gun a year at okay. most. But you're still keeping your hand in it. Oh yeah, still keeping my hand in it. Basically, I'm a gun maker. Yeah. Uh, even though I, I own the lock company and own the rifle kit company. And all I figure that's where the real joy comes from. At heart, I'm still just one of the other custom gun makers. Uh -huh. And um, I want to stay in that. And I was talking with Mark Silver just last week and uh, about what I might do when I retire. And I told him, boy, if I were to win the lottery, <laughs> and suddenly not have to work for a living. Uh -huh. I said, 